So they said, to wrap up, they had like a 30 minute kind of wrap up at, uh, at the end. And I was like, I, I asked, what do, you, what do you mean? Like, well, just kind of sum up what you said earlier in the morning. I said, that sounds boring. And <laughs> something that people wouldn't want to hear. So they said, well, what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, okay, this is the one thing that I think um, is, it's really been on my heart for a really long time. I don't know if any of you, uh, this will sound lame. Uh, I don't know if any of you listen to, we do a podcast every week of, uh, okay, it's a couple guys, so. Okay, so, so, um, and one of, the, one of the things we do is we do series, and so it's like, you know, maybe a four weeks or a six week kind of a, a thing of like diving deeply into a topic, and this is one that I've just been praying for the Lord to open a, open a way um, to be able to talk about this, because it's just been so important to me, and I think it's important to all of us, because I, I would love to be able to talk about the, the, the reality of the Eucharist. Um, my guess is that most people, maybe, maybe not, I don't want to assume anything, that most people here you get it. You're like, yeah, John 6, dialed in. Really, the Eucharist really is Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mass is really important because it really is Jesus. Yep, got it. Um, but then when it comes to like actually praying the Mass, we don't know how to do it. Now, you might know how to do it, and you'll be in the minority, though. And so what I want to talk about is, is that, is that kind of sense of how do we, how do we pray the Mass. And so um, if we were, if I were to give this in a different context, you know, I don't know if you want to put the slide back up. I'm going to go through the slides. I apologize for those who uh, won't be able to see me. Um, <laughs> that was not how I wanted to say it. Uh, but so when it comes to mass, like imagine that we're in the church, um, just like we were right before lunch today. If I were to ask the question, what are we here for? Like, what do we, when we go to mass, what are we there for? Give glory to God, communion, offer sacrifice, witness sacrifice. Yeah, all those things. Uh, yeah, we're, we're there to ultimately, uh, the question is, when we show up for Mass, are we just fans? What, what I mean by that is, is like, you know, so you have fans, and I wish I had an Eagles jersey on there now. <laughs> I didn't realize when I was getting the slides ready that like that you have people who are fans and right and those those fans are they're willing to wear the t-shirts right they're willing to wear someone else's number on their back or someone else's name on their back someone else's number on their chest and you think like okay that's interesting sometimes we show up to mass because we're fans we're fans of the lord um and some people take it to an extreme where they uh might get tattoos of john elway's jersey on their back um that would be one thing and painful and <laughs> unnecessary um <laughs> Some people have even like celebrities uh, tattooed on their sides. I don't know if you can tell who that is. Um, it's me, y'all. It's Miley. <laughs> A big fan of Miley Cyrus got her face emblazoned on their side. Um, sometimes people even like Taco Bell so much that they, uh, you know, cause, because we're fans a lot of times. Um, we just go nuts. But being a fan, you know, and it doesn't, it's not just growing up. Sometimes if you were like grew up in a sports family, you know that it starts early uh, for you. <laughs> they raise them, start them young, those Penguins fans. Um, sometimes even when you're on the team, they don't even respect you. <laughs> Let's go back to that again. No, no, nothing, nothing. Um, but, but again, like what, what do fans do is we say right there, fans cheer, right? So fans like say, go do the thing. And that's one of the reasons why whenever I'm talking, I talked with the guys last night, some of the guys, and I was like, I don't like watching sports because um, I always think like that, I want to watch someone else do the thing that I love. Like that seems really weird to me sometimes because um, fans, they do, they, they, they cheer. Uh, but ultimately fans watch. What it comes down to it is, is you show up, I mean, what, actually you can ask the question, you can say, wh where would you rather be? When it comes to your favorite sporting event, and then I had to be really honest last night with the guys when I was saying that I don't like being a fan, don't like watching. Then I started thinking, well, actually, there are some things, like the Olympics, I like to watch. Um, and some other comp competitions I like to watch, so I have to realize that I do like to watch. But even if you are someone who loves the sport of whatever the sport is, would curling. Ah, <laughs> uh, curling. <laughs> this Olympics brought out, made all these ordinary, normal, nice people into curling fans. <laughs> it's shuffleboard. <laughs> I shuffleboard it. I sweep at the Olympic level. Yeah, whatever, no big deal. <laughs> Might as well have Olympic beer pong while we're at it. You know, just like why? I don't, anyways. 
The, the people who won were from Duluth. I find that's pretty cool too. Um, so would you rather watch your favorite sports from like, you know, home on the big screen? Um, maybe you want to go to the stadium and watch. Um, some people are saying, no, 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 I don't like, I don't, I don't want to be at home. I don't want to be um, even in the stands. Like I want to be up close. I want to be there on the, on the sidelines, you know? But even if you think about this question is like, would you rather be on the sidelines? Here you are, you know, <laughs> lonely. Standing there, cheering on your teammates. Or would you rather be actually at, up to the plate? Like, would you rather actually be on the field? Would you rather want to be like, I'm no, there, I'm on the court, I, I'm, on, I'm on the pitch, that, that uh, I'm doing the thing, even though they're mean people. <laughs> See that again? <laughs> Sometimes I just sit here and I just go, wow, that's phenomenal. So even though, even though, because even though that, that's going to happen sometimes, you know, where you can have, be on the field, swarm, that was the last time, I promise. Um, uh, is if you ask the question, would you rather be at home watching, in the stadium, on the sidelines, or on the field? If you love the sport, you're like, I want to be on the field. I want to play. I actually don't just want to watch. And yet, so often, we just watch. So let's rewind to about two hours ago, when we were in the church over there. Sometimes we can imagine that the church itself is, um, so that's the stands, right? Those are the bleachers, where, where y'all sit. That's, that's the bleachers. But then up around the altar, that's where the players play. But we have to realize that that's not true. That the entire church building, that, that whole space where all the people of God go, like that's the field. You're on the field. When you walk into a Catholic church and you go into your pew, you're now on the field. You're not on the sidelines. You're not watching from a distance. You're not definitely not in the bleachers. You are on the court. You're on the playing field. Like you're standing up, sitting down, kneeling, all those things. You're playing the game. You're in the game. That's what it's meant to be. But again, so often we just kind of sit back and we watch. Um, years ago, I had gone to, uh, I, I, we, had a, we have a sister diocese called St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's a Caribbean island nation in the Caribbean. It's an island, <laughs> its own country, um, and uh, they're a sister diocese. And so as a, one of my seminarian summers, they said, well, Mike, we're going to send you to St. Vincent for the summer. <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess. <laughs> if any of you young men are considering the seminary, they sometimes send you to the Caribbean for summer. <laughs> but I went down there, and it was interesting because I, I, um, I went to a movie a couple times. I went to actually The Mummy, uh, when I, Mummy 2, to be perfectly honest, in case you were really splitting hairs, I don't think you're that old. Like, no, uh, it was The Mummy 2 down in St. Vincent, and I had already seen The Mummy up in Minnesota. But there's an interesting thing about Minnesota when we go to movies. We go to movies, and have you heard of Minnesota Nice? Minnesota Nice is a real thing. Basically, um, it, it, it means you just let, let people be. You don't get in their way. Um, a, a, an outgoing, an extroverted Minnesotan is one who looks at your shoes when he's talking to you. Um, <laughs> So, so this, that, this, this idea of like going into a movie, like you, we go into the movie and we sit down and we are quiet and we watch it and we might go, ha, 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 at the appropriate time. But there's no more than that. Like no whispering, no talking, no like making other noises other than, Ooh. ha, that's it. So I went to St. Vincent to watch The Mummy 2 and it was, that was not my experience. In St. Vincent, it was, it was a, audience participation kind of movie. Like, uh, many, t multiple times during the screening or the viewing of this movie, everyone in the theater was, except for one white guy, was standing up, <laughs> literally standing up in the theater, yelling at the screen. Like, there's this one scene where they're, I think, uh, it's kind of like some kind of flying device, and the mummy has become, like, a big mouth of sand, and he's chasing them, and they're like, go, go! I'm like, it's already filmed! Like, you... You're not going to add anything to this. <laughs> but they were just so like, no, we're, they, they, they participated in the movie, even though they had, they had no bearing on the outcome of the movie. But they saw themselves not as mere spectators. They were like, no, this is how you watch a movie. You participate in the movie. You interact with the movie, even though the movie doesn't interact back with you. But, um, but then again, part of that is, has to do with 
I just love this. Maybe it'd be cultural, like where it comes to overreacting and things like this. I just like this example. I, I put in 10 of these slides, so we're just going to keep watching it again and again. This is not me replaying it. There it is. This is how I watch. This is how other, <laughs> other people watch, and this is how I watch. I just sit there and we watch. And this question, does the, this video look more like how you go to Mass, or does this look like how you go to Mass? <laughs> this looks a lot more like how we go to Mass. We just sit back again and we watch. But then we ask the question, what are we here for? What do we go to the church for? Do we go to the church to watch? Or do we go to Mass to worship? Sorry, the answer. <laughs> we go to Mass to worship. Like mass is ultimately all about worship. It's not about watching. And so if, if in, in, in the church, the pews are, is, it, it's what it is to be on the field. Then we have to understand this, this deep and profound truth that I'm not there to watch the priest pray. I'm there to pray with the priest. I'm not there to simply kind of like observe what's happening. I'm there to participate in it. And yet a lot of times we just watch because we go to mass, we're showing up for the wrong thing. When we go to mass, we're showing up for the wrong thing. We think that maybe um, we don't, we, again, we don't know what's happening. We think it maybe is a teaching. So you find people who leave the Catholic church because it's like, no, I go to this other church and there's amazing Bible teaching. Or those preachers are so on fire, they're so dynamic, that I have to go there for that. Or, you know, I went to Mass for a thousand years, or however long, however old I am. I went to Mass for a long, long time, and I didn't know this or that detail about Scripture. So I'm going to go to Bible Church where they're going to teach me the Scripture. And that's, that's great. We want to learn something from Mass. We want to learn something from the homily. Hopefully the priest or deacon or bishop has prepared enough to teach us something. Yes, that's very good. But that's not, that's not the point of worship is to learn more. It's good when we do, but it's not the point. It is definitely not the point to be entertained. Like Mass is not, as you probably know, Mass is not there to entertain us. It's not there to be the kind of thing that just um, inspires us. Because inspiring me, inspiring us, is the, uh, that's the holy way of saying entertaining me. Right? I mean, because I'm entertained by the movie. I'm entertained by the program. I'm entertained by the song. But I'm inspired when this, this church service did what? Uh, I guess entertained me. Now I want to do more of that. Because I was entertained once, and I want to go be entertained again. I was inspired once, and I want to go be inspired again. And yet, the mass worship, worship, not just mass, worship is not about education or entertainment. And when we start thinking it's about entertainment, then it leads to all sorts of messed up stuff. <laughs> if you see this in the near future, please call Bishop Michael Burbage. <laughs> it should never happen. Please report to your local authorities. Um, <laughs> but this, it's sorry, it's a priest dressed like a clown during mass. That's not appropriate. Um, we have to understand, though, that um, the heart of every religion, if you, if you back this up and say, okay, so what is religion about? Is it about education? Well, it's good to learn things about God, who we are, what his plan is. So good. Is it about inspiration and entertainment? Well, it's, I like being entertained like anyone else. I like being inspired like everyone else. But if you go across the board for virtually every religion that has ever existed from the dawn of time well, I would say almost to now. No, from the dawn of time till about 1,500 years ago, 500 years ago, I mean, part of every religion is worship. Like, that's what, worship, that's what religion was about. We think religion is about morality, about rules, about teaching, about knowing the dogma, knowing the catechism. Those are all parts, elements of religion, but the heart of every religion throughout history has been worship. Like, that's why we come together. Not for education, not for entertainment. We come together to worship God or the gods, or whoever it is we've made into our God. Heart of every religion is worship. And the heart of worship, the heart of worship is sacrifice. Again, go look at any, any real religion that has existed throughout time. Its heart is worship 
And the core of that worship is we take whatever we have that's best and we give it to God or the gods. We take whatever it has, whatever we have that we value more than anything else and we give it to God. And sometimes that's been really distorted, right? So sometimes you have like the first uh, fruits of my field or the first fruits of my crops. Sometimes it's my firstborn. That's it going askew right there, by the way. But the heart of every religion is how can I give God the best that I have? Do you understand then? The worship is not about getting. Worship is about giving. So when I say, someone says, well, yeah, I've been going to Mass for however long, but man, I just don't get anything out of Mass. A couple things. I mentioned this in the video, so hopefully it's not too redundant, but first thing I want to say to a Catholic who says they don't get anything out of Mass is, okay, so like when the Word of God was proclaimed, and you got to hear actually God's words spoken out loud to you, that was nothing? Then even more, when Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, transformed the bread and wine into his very body and blood, and then he actually stepped off the altar and, and fed you with, his, with God himself, that's you getting nothing? So when anyone says, I get nothing out of Mass, like, oh, so I get, apparently, again, God speaking to you is nothing. God feeding with his very self is nothing. But the last thing on that is, but the point of Mass is not getting anything. The point of Mass is it's worship, and the heart of worship is sacrifice. And so the point of the Mass is to give. It's to give. It's not, and some people say, yeah, because what you, what you put into is what you get out of it. I mean, I imagine you've heard that, been said in the past, like, yeah, if you put in something, then you get out. And I understand, that's, I'm not, I wouldn't argue with that, but I would still, it misses the mark a little bit. Because it misses the core point. The core point is not to get anything. The whole core point is to give everything. So, Let's even stop for a moment and ask the question. So if, uh, if I go to Mass, and that's, and that's it. if my worship is me giving what I want to give, or worship is me getting what I want to get, then who or what am I worshiping? The story I always like to share when it comes to this is Remember reflecting on my mom's birthday years ago, because my mom, she, her birthday is November 4th, for anyone who wants to send her a card. Um, <laughs> November 4th is my mom's birthday, and so as her birthday would get closer, we would say, Mom, what do you, there's six kids, Mom, what do you want us to do for your birthday? She'd always say something like, oh, it would be so nice if you kids would just clean the whole house. It'd be so awesome. we look at her like, hmm. <laughs> no, Mom, what do you really want for your birthday? Well, if you guys could just go out and rake the yard, you know, November, Minnesota, to rake the yard or shovel the driveway, you know. And we're like, yeah, Mom, I don't, what else? What does he want? Okay, fine. If you kids would just not fight the whole day, that would be awesome. Mom, you don't know us very well, do you? <laughs> so what happened ultimately is my two older sisters, they, you know, borrow some money and they borrow the car and then go shopping because they like to drive and like to shop. My older brother and I, we get on our BMX bikes, and we, honestly, this has happened. We'd get on our BMX bikes, and we'd ride around the neighborhood, and at the end of the day, we'd call our mom out onto the lawn and say, Mom, we want to show you this trick that we learned for you for your birthday. <laughs> My little brother, he liked to, you know, paint or draw or whatever, so he'd draw, color a crayon, you know, uh, uh, an image and send it to her, uh, give it to her. And, uh, you know, every time we did those things, she'd smile, she'd say thank you. But at the heart, she knew this isn't what I asked for. Because we asked her, what do you want us to do for you? She told us. But at the end of the day, we just gave her what we wanted to give her. So in that moment, who are, who are we giving the present for? Who am I offering that gift to? This is for me. This is what I wanted to do. And if I say, I like to go to the service, even if Jesus, if Jesus himself has said, listen, do this in memory of me. You want to know how you, I want to be worshipped? Do this in memory of me. You want to know how I want you for the end of time to commemorate my sacrifice? Do this in memory of me. You want, do you want to know how I want you to worship me? Do this in memory of me. Like, yeah, that's nice, but like, hmm. 
it kind of goes on and on. I don't really get anything out of it. Exactly. If I were to show up and do that, who am I loving? If I were to not show up and do what I wanted to do, who am I loving? Myself. But if I do show up and go to Mass and do this in memory of him, now who am I loving? I'm loving him. What if it's really boring? I'm loving him even more. What if the priest is awful? Then I'm loving him a ton. Because <laughs> I'm saying... I'm not here for me. I'm not here for the priest. I, God, I'm here for you. Why? Because I'm here to give you worship, and the heart of worship is sacrifice. So I'm giving you the best. That's the thing. Heart of worship is sacrifice. Imagine, back in the day, if you were uh, a Jew going to Jerusalem, to you know, one of the three times a year where you have to offer sacrifice, particularly, let's talk about Passover. You had to live with this lamb. At one point, you presented the lamb. Here you are with your family. You present the lamb to the priest, and the priest takes the lamb, strings it up, and then sacrifices it. Then you have to take it home, and then you, you know, prepare it, eat its flesh, etc. Imagine, again, presenting this lamb to the priest. It's sacrificed. And walking away going, ah, I just didn't get anything out of that. I'm not inspired. Say, well, yeah, that wasn't the point. The point was to offer the sacrifice. That's what you did. You lived with this lamb for a week, and then you presented it. Once you learned to love, that's what you do, right? You bring the lamb into your own home, and the lamb would live with you for about a week. From Palm Sunday, our, our now Palm Sunday, to essentially Good Friday, this lamb would live with you and your family. It would hopefully become precious to you. And then on Friday, you present it to the priest, and he sacrifices it. And it doesn't matter what you feel, because you're offering up the sacrifice. You wouldn't walk away and say, I don't feel anything. No, you don't, it doesn't matter if you felt anything. You gave something. You offered something. You offered the sacrifice. In this kind of situation, you realize we're doing something big. Why? Because we're taking the best we have, and we're actually giving it away. But think about that when it comes to worship. I'm taking something that is the best I have and I'm giving it away. I don't have it to use anymore. It's no longer mine. I love to think about that, when, especially when it comes to like whether it's daily mass or Sunday mass. Sunday daily mass, I'm giving, I'm giving away 30 minutes plus whatever drive time it took. I don't have that to use anymore. I'm giving it away. I'm sacrificing that time. On Sunday, here it is, an hour or more, that I'm saying, Lord, this is yours. I'm giving this away to you. And don't get to use it anymore because this is my gift to you. To be able to recognize that I'm giving the Lord something he's asking for. And even if I don't feel anything, it doesn't matter. Why? Because as Catholics, we worship a reality. We do not worship an experience. We don't worship the experience of like, going to Mass, we worship the one at the Mass. We worship God the Father. We worship God himself. And so that sense of like, I'm not getting anything out of it, great, good, perfect, ideal. Because I'm not worshiping, worshiping an experience, I'm worshiping the reality, this, this, his name is God, who's revealed to us that he is our dad. Worship is about God. And in some ways, if you've been blessed by to never feel anything at Mass, that's a blessing. To never have felt anything or to rarely feel something at Mass, that is a blessing. Why? Because you know without a doubt, I'm not here for me. I'm here for him. I'm not, worship, I'm not here because to worship myself. I'm here to worship God. Now, moving on. I don't know if you've noticed this, and this, let's be precise. Have you ever noticed who are we directing our prayers to all throughout the Mass? God. God the... Father. Have you ever noticed, like, throughout the whole Mass, we're talking, Father, Father, Father. All of these, these prayers are to the Father. We're praying to the Father. The whole thing's about giving glory and honor to the Father. And that's why we can offer up the sacrifice of the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. And if all of a sudden, Mass ceases. When, you, when I realized this, Mass ceased to be something that was like, yeah, we're going through the ritual motions. All of a sudden, became incredibly personal. I'm not just going through the ritual motions anymore. Now what I'm doing is I'm offering up the prayers to God the Father, to Dad. 
this, this has changed my, changed my life, and some of you have heard this already, but you know, when Jesus told us to call God our Father, he said, Abba, which in English, you could mean like Daddy, right? Which makes me feel uncomfortable, because I'm from the North, we don't call our dads Daddy. I feel like I'm like a Southern Belle or something. Um, I'm not calling God Daddy. And like, well, how about Papa? Okay, Papa makes me sound like Fievel from American Tale. Like, <laughs> Papa. Okay, no, I can't do that one either. But I call my dad, Dad. So what I started doing, I don't know, maybe a year ago by now, is I started, when in prayer, just calling the Father, Dad. I start my prayer by saying, Dad, and then leading in. And when Jesus taught us to call God, Abba, Dad, Man, he's a pretty smart God because uh, it immediately changed something in my heart. I get up and just say, Dad, I give you this day. At the end of the prayer is, Mom, Dad, please be with me. It's just something remarkable. And it makes Mass what it's supposed to be, which is personal. We're talking to Dad the whole Mass. We're offering the sacrifice to Dad the whole Mass. And Dad speaking to us this whole Mass. We offer our prayers to the Father. What do we offer? In very small font, <laughs> the best. We offer the best we have. And what's the best we have? We're going to fly through this as fast as we can because we got to go. The best we have is his son. I mean, to really realize this, we offer dad the best thing he's ever given any of us, which is his only begotten son. I mean, the sacrifice of the Mass, I, mean, I love this. Here is Jesus at the Last Supper, and he's offering up himself to the Father in sacrifice. And we recognize that he, when he took that bread and it became his body, he took that wine and became his blood, that what that is, is he, he's uniting the sacrifice of the Last Supper with the sacrifice of Calvary. And every single time you and I are at Mass, what we get to do we get to offer up the sacrifice of the Son to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. Father, I don't do that. I just watch. False. It's a sacrifice. This is one of the prayers from the Roman Missal. Father, calling to mind the death your Son endured for our salvation, his glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, and ready to greet him when he comes again, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. This is a sacrifice. Every Mass is a sacrifice. One, the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, but presented to us in reality in the Eucharist. And so what's happening in the Mass, it's just, if, we could, if we could understand what's happening in the Mass, is here is the priest and all the people, and you see that they're all facing the same direction. They're all offering up worship in the same direction. Offering up glory to the Father, offering up the Son to the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. I love this, where it's all the angels and saints are gathered around and we're offering up the whole Sully Sacrifice of the Mass. I could not find a clearer picture of that. <laughs> we're also offering up Jesus, the sacrifice, Jesus, the victim. Look with favor on your church's offering and see the victim whose death has reconciled us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by his body and blood. Is, it, is the priest saying, grant that I, who is nourished by his body and blood, that I may be filled with his Holy Spirit? No, it's the whole people of God praying. Grant that we, because why? Because we are offering up the, the victim. Because we, as a people, are offering up the sacrifice that we become one body, one spirit in Christ. So it's not just the priest. It's all of us, surrounded by the communion of saints. Another place where it says sacrifice, but I'm going to move forward because it's important to be on time. <laughs> More pictures of the same thing because I like those pictures a lot. Question, okay, trivia. How many priests are there in the world right now? There is one. Jesus, he's the high priest. There's only one priest. Jesus is the great high priest. But there's also ministerial priests. This is my bishop, Bishop Serba, and two guys I got ordained last summer. There's a ministerial priest. There's one great high priest. There's a bunch of ministerial priests. But then, how many people here are baptized? Okay, a couple of you. <laughs> when you were baptized, as I said earlier, you were anointed. You were anointed priest, prophet, and king. 
So who here is a priest? If you raise your hand to be, as you said, you're baptized, you are a priest. You're what they call a kingdom priest. Some people call it the priesthood of the faithful. I like to call it kingdom priests. So one great high priest, there's the ministerial priesthood, but then every baptized Christian belongs, is, is a kingdom priest. Question, what do priests do? They offer sacrifice. So you're baptized, you're baptized to be a king or queen, prophet, and a priest. So that's why, this is not just Father Mike making stuff up like, oh, hey guys, get back in mass and pray. <laughs> what does the priest tell you, or the bishop tell you every single mass? We rise, and he says, pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. My sacrifice? I'm not a priest. <laughs> yes, you are. You're a kingdom priest. And every Mass, he says, pray that my sacrifice and your sacrifice, because here I, here I am as a ministerial priest. And we can't, can't have Mass without the ministerial priests. Can't do it. But he says, my sacrifice and yours, which means that when you go to Mass, the priest is begging you every Mass, stand up, pray, my brothers and sisters, and my sacrifice and yours. But please, don't watch this. Don't just watch worship. Offer up the sacrifice with me. Because you're a priest, and too many of us waste our priesthood because we go to Mass and we don't worship, we watch. What do we offer? We offer the best, God himself. But we also offer ourselves. We also offer ourselves. Jesus Christ is the priest. Jesus is the altar. And Jesus is the sacrifice. And every person, every priest who is going to be conformed to Jesus has to not only be the priest, he also has to make himself a part of the sacrifice. I remember reading uh, Priest is Not His Own by Bishop, Archbishop Fulton Sheen after I was ordained. And he said, he had a little thing where he said, so many uh, young priests are so excited about being ordained because they can't wait to offer up the sacrifice. But so few of them realize that they not only have been conformed to Jesus the priest, they also must be conformed to Jesus, the victim. That if you're, gonna be, if you're being a priest of Jesus, that means you also have to be a sacrifice of Jesus. If you're going to be conformed to his priesthood, you must also be conformed to his victimhood. So he said, priest, every time you go to Mass, you can not only lay him, raise him up to the Father, you also have to lay yourself down on the altar. So my brothers, same thing is true for your priesthood. We not only lift up the sacrifice to the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit, but we also have to be willing to lay ourselves down as victims, as the sacrifice on the altar with Jesus. See, this is one of the reasons why I can't just go to Mass and watch. I'm going to Mass to die. <laughs> I'm going to Mass to say, okay, Lord, what is the biggest thing in my heart? I lay it down on your altar. Go to Mass to say, okay, Lord, what's the thing that's most important to me? I lay it down on your, alt on your altar with you. Lord, who is the person I love the most? I lay them down on your altar with you. That's the act of participation in the Mass that the Second Vatican Council called for. It's not we need more readers. It's not we need more extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. It's we need more priests to offer the sacrifice and unite themselves to the sacrifice because we have a whole church full of priests who are wasting their priesthood because they're willing to watch and not worship. You know, Padre Pio was such an, such, an, such an incredible example of that victim. But think about the prayer. It's prayer in the Mass again. May he make us an everlasting gift to you. You can pray, Lord, let us be an eternal oblation to you. Let us be an eternal sacrifice to you. Let us be sacrificed. You guys, this isn't just the priest saying, praying this behind the altar. This is all of us saying, Lord, make me a sacrifice. Unite me to your sacrifice. So again, imagine, prepare, imagine showing up for Mass prepared not only to lift up the sacrifice of the Son to the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit, imagine also prepared to lay down your life. Every Mass you walk in like, oh shoot, here we go again. <laughs> it's a whole new battle to get into church then. But it's not because it's boring. It's because it's Calvary. But men, gosh, if we're called to conform ourselves to Jesus, then where else are you going to be? Where else do you want to find yourself except with him? Make me an everlasting gift with you. Make us an eternal oblation with you, the priest and victim. 
Uh, last two points, and then we'll break. Or I'll, I'll, I'll take, give you a break. The highlight of the mass. Sometimes it's hard to, it's, it's hard to uh, keep this focus throughout the course of mass. Maybe you've known this forever, and you're like, ah, yeah, I just, but I lose it, Father. Like, I, I drift. The high point of the mass. It's not the homily. It's not the songs. Consecration is hugely important. But the act of worship is not just the bread and wine becoming God himself, Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, divinity. It's when we offer that to the Father. The moment is when the priest is standing there at the altar and he raises up Jesus in the bread and wine, Jesus Christ, and he says, through him, who's him? Jesus. Jesus. This is through Jesus, with Jesus, in Jesus. O God, almighty Father, all glory and honor to yours forever to you, forever and ever. Amen. That's called the great amen. Why? Because that's the moment where here is the ministerial priest who's offering up the sacrifice of the great high priest to the glory of God the Father forever and ever. And the whole people of God say, amen. But often in most Catholic parishes, it's the lame amen. <laughs> because we're checked out. Oh, this is the time I get to stand up again. Okay, gotcha. The, you know, the early church, they have writings about the church in Rome that said, the church in Jerusalem, that said that when they came time for the great amen, that the people of God would respond so powerfully with the great amen that the walls in which they were would shake. I remember telling this to a bunch of junior high kids. We had a camp. I was talking about this. And there's a young man who was in the band. He was the guitar player. He just come into the Catholic church like two months before this. So the very next mass we had, we had, you know, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all going and the amen, off to the side, this guy's like, amen. I was like, no, okay, yeah. Uh. We, had to, we had, to have a, had to have a little liturgical lesson after that. But, um. <laughs> but the great amen is, you know, so the priest, ministerial priest, gets to say those words alone, right? Through him, with him. Uh, or this is my body, this is my blood, through him, with him. That's the ministerial priest says those words alone. But the kingdom priests, are simultaneously offering up that sacrifice. And all that prayer gets wrapped up, that gets wrapped up in that one, that one word, amen. Now again, imagine, imagine how different your experience, not that we were an experience, imagine how different your participation in the mass would be if you recognized your priesthood. If you realized your priesthood and the difference that it makes in this world. Because it makes a difference. I think that's the last point I'm going to make. There it is. There's the through him, with him, in him. Amen. A lot of exclamation marks. Get pretty excited about that. Because this is the reality. I, you know, the answer to this is going to be, what are we here for? We're here to, to worship, not watch. But do we really know what the Mass does, what it's for? You actually, every single one of you has a definition for what it's for. It's for two things. And I'll let you answer the question by simply responding to me. You're going to know the answer. If I were to say, pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Father Almighty, you say... May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. Because it's at the priest's hands, right? The pre ministerial priest, he has it at his hands. So I say, pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable. You say, yay, yes. May the Lord accept, accept the sacrifice at your hands. One, for the praise and glory of his name and for the good of all his holy church. This is what the Mass does every single time. Every single time you and I go to Mass, go to worship, it is for the Father's glory and the salvation of the world. That's what happens. Every time we celebrate the Mass again, the Father is glorified once again by the infinite offering, sacrifice of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the world is once again redeemed. The world is once again made holy. The world is once again saved. 
And the Lord has sent the sacrifice to your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good, and the good of all his holy church, that the whole world is redeemed. You guys, men, please, don't waste your priesthood. You're going to lead your families to Mass tomorrow. But I invite you to show, and what's going to happen is you're going to forget this. You're going to get there and like, oh, shoot, I'm a kingdom priest. Yeah, right, that's right, that's right. But please don't waste your priesthood. To be able to, with the priest, say, no, I'm, I'm offering up that sacrifice with, with the ministerial priest. For the glory of God the Father. For the salvation of my family. For the salvation of my friends. For the salvation of my wife. For the salvation of my kids. For the salvation of the whole world. Imagine if just the 700 men in this room were to go back to their parishes and start acting, start praying, start worshiping as kingdom priests. I'll tell you what will happen. God will be glorified. And this world will never be the same.